I think Tyler said that uh, EA had peaked. Um, I think that EA's sort of destiny, it's not a, you know, it's not like a, you shouldn't think about it like a political movement the way you think about sort of libertarians or something like that, or like a conservative movement or something. Because it's, I think it real, I think that like, if you're going to focus on effectiveness, you're going to avoid controversy, like a libertarian or, you know, wokes or whatever, they're going to go and they're going to fight for the thing they want, because they think they want many people opposed strongly. Like a lot of the EA stuff, I think like where the leverage is to make the world a better place is often where people aren't thinking about the issue much. It's like, oh, like do charity this way instead of that way, or like change this little regulation that's going to, you know, harm, you know, that's been harming technological development. Um, and so Scott Alexander, uh, had I think he he linked to some website that listed some ac recent accomplishments of EA and they were you know they were impressive and I hadn't heard about any of them uh, until then and maybe that's you know if EA wants to do good it can sort of do good in the shadows I think it's it's probably not going to be a uh, sort of a trendy and then you know there's cost to that because if you're just sort of doing things sort of behind the scenes um, you know you're not really building and becoming a giant movement or whatever. Um, but I think that's sort of the limit. That's the, that's the sort of inherent limitation of just focusing on, you know, just completely being utilitarian and focusing what's, uh, what's effective. You're not going to inspire people, but that's okay. You could do some good things in the meantime. This week on Upstream, I sit down with political scientist and writer Richard Hanania. This is Richard's third appearance on the show, and we discuss the Israel-Palestine conflict, why the modern right needs a new mythos, Richard's upcoming debate with Curtis Yarvin, and more. Please enjoy. Richard, welcome back to the podcast. Great to be here, Eric. Thanks for having me again. So last time we spoke about your book, The Origins of Woke, which is doing very well. Highly recommend people uh, purchase it and read it if they haven't yet. And uh, it's interesting because uh, DEI is even more in the news. Uh, and, you know, ever since you, you published, we've had uh, Bill Ackman and Chris Rufo's quest to uh, to unseat the presidents of, of some major universities, Harvard, Penn, MIT, and having some success with uh, Harvard and uh, Penn. Um, is this the kinds of efforts, the coordinated efforts that you uh, you recommend and think is uh, positive for the for the overall movement, or what, what do you make of uh, of what's been happening so far? Yeah, I mean it's not a bad thing um, that you know you have these very left wing college presidents and they're being fired. Is it the most? Is it going to fundamentally change these institutions? Uh, no, it's not you, really. You think they the just hire of... replacements that are like them, effectively? Like probably, no but yeah, but you, I mean, I mean, the benefit might be you have a you have a chilling effect, but you know they're not. It's not you know it's just because they're uh, because of they you know they made Jewish students feel unsafe. So even even the justification is like a DEI style justification. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I wrote an article about this, about, I think the long-term political effect of all this is to make some Jewish billionaires more conservative. I mean, we can think about the ones who've been in the news. And so that's not nothing. I mean, such people are very powerful and you want them on your side. And if you just a few Jewish billionaires, you know, want to, uh, start supporting right-wing causes instead of left-wing causes, or be a, maybe a little less enthusiastic about supporting left-wing causes, that's a good thing. Um, is this going to end wokeness or anything? Uh, no, I think that'll take more sustained political action. Yeah. And so what is your advice to, to Rufo and Ackman uh, for, for their goals? Like, What, what would it be the, the highest leverage thing they could focus on? You know, the Rufo, I mean, Rufo wrote an article in City Journal the other day, uh, which just basically, you know, it, it took my suggestions. You know, he cited me in, in there. Um, and he says, you know, Executive Order 11246, um, he, that's affirmative action to contracting. He talks about the disparate impact standard. At the state level, they're doing exciting things with school choice. I mean, so it's it's a pretty boring answer. But I, I mean, Rufo, Rufo has it figured out. I mean, it's not rocket science. He's figured out sort of what what where the problems are you know, thanks to my work and other people. And he's, you know, sort of pushing politicians in the right direction. So it's not, it's not a, it's not, it's not a big, you know, secret or, or mystery. Um, 
the it's funny, you know, DeSantis sort of he got those things and just thinking about sort of Trump is going to be the nominee. You know, he'll do some of it just by accident, just because he's going to appoint conservative people and they're yeah. just going to these ideas are in the air. And so they're going to end up doing some of it. If you had DeSantis or something, you know, you'd have a kind of more uh, sustained focus on this stuff. But, you know, we're not we're not going to get that. Yeah, it, it's funny because people were saying that Ackman seems to have just discovered DEI like a few months ago uh, and, uh, you know, right away is saying, hey, this not, but not only is he, uh, unlike everybody else, he's uh, he's actually, you know, been willing to challenge. It. He's basically doing right wing cancel culture effectively, <laughs> effectively and and it's actually working uh, to, yeah. to some degree, uh, which is. Yeah, which is it's, it's a remarkable thing. I mean, it's it's funny that, you know, it, it also, I mean, the Congress having the hearing on the it's the it's the it's it's a template but it's like you know people will be like oh conservatives they don't use their power for it. like no they use the power for the things they care about like at the state level like they do these things about like uh bds like you can't boycott israel or like you can't work for the state or something like that and so this is that kind of thing it's like the the pro-israel position where it's but it was like congress and right-wing twitter and bill ackman um we're all talking about the same thing. And then right wing press machine, like New York Post and these things were all like talking about the exact same thing and they were pushing in the exact same direction. Um, and you could do something like that. Like they don't do that. It's not coordination. It's not conscious. Court. It's like what Congress actually cares about because Congress is sort of the head. They could call people and they could shine the light on things. And when everything's moving in the same direction, then things can happen. Yeah, it's it's funny how uh, all, sort of the plots converge in terms of uh, you know ten seven in Israel. Uh, now we're talking about DEI in in uh, in colleges, and it's all it's all like one, one straight line. It, it's also f funny how the the conversations are basically going. What I'm hearing from uh, conversations with these universities is they're trying to get um, you know Jews to be part of the progressive stack, uh, basically put Jews in DEI so you don't have to get rid of DEI. Um, and another thing that's interesting to your point on sort of the, the Jewish realignment is this is an acceptable way of critiquing BLM because you can't say, you know, you can't say you can't complain about anti-white, but you can't complain about anti-Semitism and that, you know, Jew yeah. is just a subset of, of white. And so you could say, hey, BLM is anti-Semitic, woke is anti-Semitic. And so that just creates an attack vector, acceptable attack vector, uh, which didn't exist prior. Yeah, I mean, from a you know, from a, um, a truthful standpoint, I mean, it, it's I, I don't know if there's much independent anti-Semitism um, that is separate from the anti-whiteism. But like, I don't think that there's like there there's just not, but it's just it, I mean, happens to be anti-Semitic, just like anti-white happens to be anti-British uh, or something. It's just it just happens to be that way. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't have like I don't have to think. Oh, they have to say it in this exact way, or they have to have this exact right justification it's good you know these people who are very anti-israel who, who sympathize with hamas they tend to be terrible in every other way too um so like you know these people sort of not having influence or positions in administrations is a good thing yeah do you um there was this uh, tweet that went around that's basically saying that sentiment towards israel palestine is um you know so age polarized um, similar to our generation polarized, similar to how gay marriage was generation polarized, that uh, it was just inevitable that gay marriage was going to become sort of, uh, you know, accepted once, uh, once enough time had passed. Do you think that's similar to the sort of Palestine, Israel sympathy that when these college st students who, you know, favor Palestine in droves, uh, you know, get into these organizations 10 years from now, that they're going to influence them to be pro-Palestinian organizations? Or do you think they're, uh, you know, different you know likely to change their mind in a way that they didn't around gay marriage i don't know if they change their mind but you know foreign policy is usually not on people's radar right so it's like is young people more pro i think more young people are actually more uh, not as anti-russian as old people i've seen polls like that like the old people i don't know they remember the cold war or something but like does that matter what our policy is going to be against russia in 30 years i don't think so because like unless there's a war going on like ukraine like nobody's going to be thinking about russia but there's going to be policy there's going to be something going on with russia that like the american president is going to have to negotiate with and like public opinion just sort of fades into the background because it's not a it's not a very salient issue you know like gay marriage was settled because the Supreme Court uh, ruled that gay marriage, you know, the Supreme Court's not going to rule that, you know, there's going to be a two state solution and, you know, Palestinians have to have their own state. There's no, there's sort of nowhere to go. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, if you're Israel, I, I don't think it's, you know, what American public opinion is going to be in 20, 30 years. 
is your biggest concern. I think your biggest concern is probably winning the war. I mean, there's reports that Israel is going all in. They're increasing their military spending. They don't need the U. I mean, they don't like actually need the U.S. And hopefully they would get it to the point where we're one day where they don't. And, you know, at that point, like, what does it even matter that much? Yeah, it's, it's interesting to watch sort of how sentiment um, evolves. It, it feels like the the sort of Israel-Palestine has been the first wedge issue where there's a, um, you know, sort of fight between establishment and woke uh, Democrats uh, on, and, and, yeah. and sort of, uh, you know, moderates aren't afraid to push back because they feel like they have the moral high ground, whereas in previous sort of culture wars, they, they didn't feel like that. Or there's this sort of schism. And I, I one way I think about that is there's like, you know, you wrote in your post in the right sort of the Jewish realignment, how Jews are so influential in the donor class, um, you know, 10 percent of billionaires, like 20 percent of donors or, or something like this with but so small numbers wise. So there's there's a huge divergence between yeah. sort of population size and uh, their, their influence um, or, or, you know, monetary influence. And so it feels like it's just going to continue to be a wedge issue in, in our for you know, in my local uh, industry tech. Um, it feels like, you know, people are starting to speak up more for sort of Palestinian. We have Paul Graham, uh, you know, Amjad, even Sam Altman, um, you know, had a, a, a sort of another sort of saying, hey, Muslims are discriminated against in tech or something. And so it's I'm curious how, if you see sentiment changing or evolving or, um, yeah, how, how you see that playing out. You say you say that people in tech are, are taking more pro Palestine positions. Well, I guess I should say before it was like 99 to one and now it's like 95 to five or 90 to 10. Like I, I just like meaning it was 90. It was unanimously pro-Israel. And okay. now I see a, a little bit of sympathy for, for Palestine. So it's, it's still overwhelmingly pro-Israel. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's rare in tech to have a culture issue that isn't unanimous. Um, mm -hmm. You know, tech isn't like a super sophisticated cult culture you know, place. And so it's the first time in my you know career where there are, uh, you know, s smart people on both sides of a culture issue who can publicly. Uh, really? I mean, the woke seems to be very divisive in tech. Aren't there very woke tech people and very anti-woke oh, well, tech people? It's, it's been very woke uh, up until the last like year or two. Most people who are anti-woke couldn't say anything publicly. Uh, 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 you know, Vivek was like one of the first, you know, and he's not really in tech. Well, anymore. Elon Musk, Mark Andreessen, I know they've been. Yeah, this, is all the last, this is all in the last year or last two. It's, it's like this, a little this, bit longer than that. Yeah. I mean, these okay. guys have been anti-woke for, for a little longer. But uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, all right. But they, they haven't been anti-DEIs. You know, find me Mark saying something anti-DEI or, I mean, most people haven't been anti-DEI until like last few months. Or mm -hmm. by, I mean, publicly publicly yeah. saying DEI is bad. So you the, the standard murder. position in tech was woke and pro-Israel is what you're saying. And now it's anti-woke and a little or a mixed. No, no, I, I think people were always privately anti-woke and yeah. in um, and sort of over time in, you know, um, they took baby steps towards sharing public, like, you know, Brian Armstrong's, hey, we're not going to talk about politics. He didn't even establish an anti-woke position in 2020, but he got yeah. flamed for for it. And no, no company followed suit up until like a couple of years later. And now it's the norm. So people have always been privately anti-woke. And now more recently in the last couple of years, a few years, they're more comfortable saying in baby steps. Um, and they'll increasingly say, it, I, I think. Yeah. But um, the pro-Israel, I think it's a little bit the opposite, whereas some people are sympathetic to Palestinian cause, but don't feel comfortable saying it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, up until Paul Graham or maybe a couple others. But, uh, but I think tech is largely you know, pro-Israel and, you know, yeah. it's very Jewish. Yeah. But, I mean, that's interesting. Yeah. You said uh, uh, Jews were like 20% of the donor class or something like that. If you go to the top donors, I mean, when you're talking like the top 10, 20, it's like 50%. I mean, it's really oh, wow. just amazing. Um, you know, the, the influence, you know, you just look at the top 10 donors, it's like top 10 Democratic or Republican people yeah. who donate to a Democrat or Republican or these super PACs or whatever. Uh, yeah. I think it's depending on the year, but it's like, yeah, third to 50% or something. Um, and so this is, this is huge. And if you just move a few of these people, um, you can, you know, like, you know, Peter Thiel, uh, basically got two, uh, one senator and then want the nominee for another, uh, you know, just Blake Masters wouldn't have been, wouldn't have been even in the conversation. He was the candidate. He only lost by a few points. J.D. Vance, you know, he had an independent sort of identity. Maybe he would have won on his own, but you can see just one person can, you know, almost, you know, arguably get two Senate seats or come close to it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, just a few donors, you know, can have a, can have a massive, um, influence. And so that's like, 
you know, most foreign policy issues are usually so, you know, they're usually in the background um, and people get bored. Like even Ukraine is not completely in the background because Congress still has to pass. Uh, it's still they're debating legislation to give yeah. them more money. Um, and, you know, public opinion matters. But like people just I mean, just because it requires a constant infusion of, of funds. Yeah. I mean, most people, well, I guess Israel, Israel gets a constant infusion of funds. So you'd have to get a long way before, um, before you I, got to that point where that was, that was threatened. But most of the time, this stuff is just in the background. Yeah. I, I guess my prediction is that this is a issue that as long as the war keeps going on, it is not solved in some degree. You know, uh, I, I think that the culture war, um, will continue around this issue because it's a convenient way to attack wokeness um and because there are people who are genuinely split on the issue yeah. and both are uh feel empowered to say their views publicly um and unlike well, well, you, the situation yeah. in ukraine um well you talk are, about america becoming more pro-israel or, or not or less pro-israel or whatever i think it, like with many things is going to be huge huge polarization i think that the republican party you know trump was the most pro-israel president he did things that were unthinkable before uh like recognizing golan heights uh moving the embassy to jerusalem this was things that people talked about for a while it was like nobody imagined that uh american president would do it so trump did that um i think whether trump or you know it's going to be trump probably but you know the uh, the next trumps like everyone who's anyone in the republican uh, party is pretty much completely pro-Israel and the Democrats are divided. And so I, I don't, you know, I think that like, you know, people can have very unpopular positions like the pro-life position, right? And they can just have one party. So I think Israel is a place where it has one party. Just one party is not gonna is not gonna budge from the pro-Israel position. And then as long as there are some you know, uh, Jewish people on the left who care about Israel, who like Israel, that's going to be a very divide, and the, that will always exist. That's going to be a very divisive issue on the left. Um, so yeah, public opinion is going to move, but I think we're going to polarize Republicans, pro-Israel, Democrats. You know, maybe maybe these fights, but it, it's 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 it, that that's mostly a good position for the right. If it unites one side and divides another, that's exactly what you want. We'll continue our interview in a moment after a word from our sponsors. Real quick, what's the easiest choice you can make? Taking the window instead of the middle seat, outsourcing business tasks that you absolutely hate. What about selling with Shopify? <laughs> Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the US. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Whether you're selling security systems or marketing memory modules, Shopify helps you sell everywhere, from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. I've used it in the past at the companies I've founded, and when we launch merch here at Turpentine, Shopify will be our go-to. Shopify helps turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, up to 36% better compared to other leading commerce platforms. And Shopify helps you sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. With Shopify Magic, whip up captivating content that converts from blog posts to product descriptions. Generate instant FAQ answers. Pick the perfect email send time. Plus, Shopify Magic is free for every Shopify seller. Businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash Tornberg. Go to shopify.com slash Tornberg now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. That's shopify.com slash Tornberg. Yeah, you, you had on, on your uh, great podcast, Clown Car, uh, your friend Philip uh, Lemoyne, I, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, and he had a different view on sort of the, you guys had a great sort of disagreement or debate on sort of the Israel-Palestine situation. How, how would you characterize both of your, both of your positions? So I think his position, uh, you know, if I'm going to uh, give the best version of his position, his position is that Palestinians and Israelis, their only real path to some kind of, you know, way out of this conflict is they, um, you know, there's some negotiations, serious, you know, concessions on both sides, and Israel's going to have to take steps to not kill so many Palestinian civilians, uh, pull back its war ambitions, um, live with Hamas still in power. You know, he, he even says, you know, just getting rid of Hamas is not even a, uh, uh, is not even, you know, a realistic sort of option. And my view is there's not much evidence that, um, the Palestinians, you know, could make peace that they, that 
like Israel stepping back or Israel being humane wouldn't just be taken as an opportunity to do more things against Israel. And I do think that there's, you know, potentially a solution here. I think that, um, and he says this, and he says this is completely unrealistic, um, that, you know, that you eventually try to get the people of Gaza to leave. And it's like, everyone says no, Biden says no, and the Egyptians say no, and the Arabs say no. Now, like, Okay, like people are saying no now, um, but the idea—the idea really is only you know a couple months old. Um, people in Israel have been talking about it. Nikki Haley has pretty much endorsed it. So you have like it, it is something like you could imagine American president actually putting political capital and money behind this idea. So it's like now, like Biden, you know, the Democrats are too left wing to do it. But it doesn't seem to me like it's that big of a deal. And I think one thing that Trump showed. Um, was that you could, uh, you know, you could just buy off the the Gulf Arabs. I mean, you could just, you know, they're not, you know, they're, they're very sort of rational businessmen, um, and um, you know, and I think they're doing the best thing for their country actually, just to be bought off rather than fighting for the Palestinian cause forever is actually the you know the best things for their country. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know why it is unrealistic to have some kind of population transfer. And you know, Matthew Glacius has written about this too. This is seen as some kind of great, great war crime, but in every other conflict, like we say, it's a good thing for people, you know, to be able to leave and you know, be, uh, leave as refugees. So in this in this particular case, we say that this is a horrible war crime, but it's, that's just not a consistent standard we apply. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious where you differ or where you think that J John Mearsheimer is in incorrect. Um, he was uh, famous for sort of a number of things, but uh, most recently, in the last few years, his, his strong view that. Um, on the Ukraine situation, we had um, instigated it by not, uh, you know, by, by a few efforts that we did to not make clear that Ukraine would not be part of NATO, et, et cetera. And he, I think he recently said something like um, the the sort of our support of Israel is less in the U.S. national interest and more just a result of the power of the of the Jewish lobby in, 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 in the U.S. Do you feel that he's incorrect when he says it's not in the U.S. national interest? You know, what is national interest, though? Because it, it's, it's a very slippery concept. I mean, states have idealistic interests. So when someone says, you know, we shouldn't be party to a genocide, well, that's not in America's interest. It's like, okay, well, you have a humanitarian, that's fine. We have that. So, you know, what is sort of like, it, it's sort of slippery. Sometimes Mersheimer and these realist types, they act like there's a, uh, you know, it's just like, you know, it's, it's sort of reduct I, I took a class with Mersheimer. was at University of Chicago Law School, so I took a class. He was teaching IR graduate courses. Um I just said, like, the reductio ad absurdum of this, like, realist philosophy is just, like, America should only use it. Okay, enslave the rest of the world, <laughs> right? Like, threaten to nuke the rest of the world and enslave them. That would be in our interest. But he doesn't believe that. And nobody actually says that. So everyone is operating according to some moral, uh, some kind of moral system. And so, you know, I, I bring that to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and we debate, you know, whether Israel or Palestine sort of has the moral high ground here. But I think we all sort of bring a, a moral outlook to these things. Yeah, that uh, that makes sense. I, I want to segue to a, d a different topic. In our, in our last interview, we talked about uh, your sort of your Nietzschean uh, liberalism, uh, sort of liberalism with group differences. Not not to uh, you know crudely su summarize, but you you wrote a blog post a few months ago uh, about Bronze Age perverts' new book uh, titled "A um, a Non Christian Mythos for the for the for the New Right." Uh, yeah, and, something like and, that. Yeah, yeah, and I'm I'm, I'm curious if you can unpack. Uh, what, 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 what you meant by that. Yeah. I mean, the, the BAP thing, I mean, he's, he's a weird guy. He's genuinely a weird guy. He tells, he like, just like sort of trolls me with like these things that these weird conspiracy theories, like don't let, don't, I'll tell the truth about you and your partner. He said it's some, I don't know who my partner is. I don't even know who he's talking about, much less what he's talking about. And so he's a, he's a very sort of weird guy. It's not just, it's not just an act. It's not just a, a performance art. He's, uh, you know, sort of just, you know, he's, he's out there. Um, you know, but I'm not, you know, I, I think that like there's a sort of, you know, there's sort of a rising sort of socialism, nationalist economics on the right, which I don't like, which I appreciate Mr. Pervert pushing back on. You know, I liked his article about Millet in Argentina recently. Um, and then, you know, I, I think that the, you know, I think that the, uh, the pro-life stuff and just this sort of constellation of issues, you know, just anti-biotech and all these other things that go along with it, I think that's harmful. So I like the fact that he's pushing back against this stuff. Um, 
you know, I read <laughs> there was a, uh, a a review of his book uh, in Quillette by Oliver Tradley, which which I think like did a really it was a pretty thorough takedown of like sort of just you know sort of the word games you know that he's playing, um, and so like I don't know if it's like the greatest intellectual you know his, bruce's book is the greatest intellectual achievement um but i i do take the idea seriously and you know this is something i should write more about maybe i was just too quick to grasp on to to, to bap as you know perhaps you know it's something it's, it's something there but like there needs to be some kind of um some kind of you know right right wing you know let's say even like right wing like uh thing that's not just, you know, calculating utils, not just sort of rationalism, not just, you know, we're going to have, you know, the, uh, the charts go up. The charts go up is great. I mean, but it, it, it needs a narrative. It needs some kind of emotional punch, punch to it. Um, and, you know, that mythos, what exactly is it going to be is something that I'm still sort of thinking about uh, and working on. One thing you've also been thinking about is, um, you know, how much truth can the can the world take uh, or, or how true should we be? And you had this one piece where there is this group of people who are trying to sort of reclaim eugenics. <laughs> um, and uh, you say, hey, maybe if you if you want to stick to truth, may, maybe there's something admirable there. But if, if you want to win, you're you're hurting yourself. Um, and so it's a it's it's this broader idea of sort of, yeah, how, how true should you be versus how strategic should, should you be if you're trying to get across your Well, point? playing around with words is not, you know, dishonest. It's just, it's just words. I mean, we could, we can use definitions, you know, as we like them. There was a, the, the point of that piece, I mean, the New, there was a New York Times ethicist article um, where somebody wrote in um, and they were like, we worry that embryo selection, um, uh, or we're not embryo selection, you know, uh, something, something, should we abort a baby with Down syndrome? I don't know if they had that test back or they were going to, or something, but they're like, I, we worry that this is eugenics. Oh, they were thinking about doing the prenatal testing. I think they hadn't done it yet. And that is like, the, they wanted to know, not like, is this good for society or good for us or something like that? It was like, is it eugenics? Right. And I, I just found that framing interesting because people like, I want to do this thing. Is it racist? Like they have the word and they just need to be assured that that bad word that they think that it's bad, that they're not doing it. And the, and the, you know, the ethicist, of course, since this is a very common, you know, the thing that all liberals and a lot of other people do um, to tell them, no, it's not eugenics because it's not coercive and you're not consciously trying to improve the race. And like most down syndrome. It was funny. It's like most down syndrome people don't reproduce anyway. So it's like, it's not going to have a eugenic. So it's like, if they, you know, like that is the moral like distinction. Like if they were able to have like a lot of kids, then it would be eugenics so and then you couldn't abort them. Right. It was, it's a very sort of weird uh, thing, but it was just like, it was so focused, this ethicist, you know, so focused on definitions. And so like, don't try to reclaim, like just argue for the right thing. And don't, you don't need to reclaim words that have baggage, right? You can argue things without the words. The words don't have objective definitions. The, wor the words are, a word has a technical definition and a word also has connotations, right? So like when you call someone um, an idiot, right? That used to be a clinical term. I bring this up in the article, right? Imbecile, moron. These were clinical terms. Now they have connotations. Now, if you're, you know, your son has mental problems, you don't say he's a, he's an imbecile, right? You, you just don't do that just because the connotations are negative. Uh, so this is just sort of a, this is a broad lesson of like what, you know, how people should approach sort of pol political debates. Yeah. But and it's also, I, I think what you're saying is that these people who are trying to make better people, the Jonathan anomalies of the world, the, the Malcolm, Call, the, the pronatalists uh, or people, it, we, they slash we should find a, a narrative that is that is captivating other than um, other than some data story because people have to justify it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's amazing. I saw this meme the other day that Brian Kaplan tweeted. It was like, you know, uh, nothing, the universe is nothingness, but then it's like, it shows a guy like I am the... Uh, uh, entro uh, entro uh, entropy miracle of like you know billions of years of the you know development of the universe and it's like yeah there's like an amazing there's an amazing story there even if it even if it's like fake if you could even if you could have like a religious stuff that i didn't think was true right you just want to sort of hand wave and say the ai is god or you know the space-time continuum there's always you know you're always out there somewhere or the, you know the singularity but i'm not i'm not that against that i i, I just think yeah i think there's a uh uh, this is something that people need to sort of think about. They, they, the pro market people, I mean, I think they stick to utilitarian arguments because their utilitarian arguments are good and they're correct and they're a lingua franca. You could always use a utilitarian argument. 
you can always use it um, because nobody will say that their ideology will make humanity worse off, right? So it makes sense in any context. Um, but then, you know, when you rely on that and you have nothing else, you don't have the emotional thing that really motivates people. I mean, why do people hate DEI? You know, I've very recently written about, despite you know, yeah. myself writing a book on the topic that it's not necessarily the most, it's, you know, like if we're going to be, if our, you know, if our descendants are going to be traveling the stars or extinct in 500 years, I don't think DEI is like one of the five or 10 most likely things to tr determine that. Um, but, you know, it has an emotional punch. I mean, people care about this more than they care about a lot of issues on both sides, the left with the wokes and, and the anti-wokes too. Um, and so I think like maybe part of this, uh, uh, project is like finding the important stuff and then wrapping it in a narrative that gets people, you know, excited right. because you want people focusing on the, the things that actually matter. And the important stuff here is the, um, is markets and uh, yeah, biotech progress generally. Yeah. I mean, the, we should be, we should be bettering ourselves and living standards and seeing that as like part of a beautiful story. Right. I, I mean, I have cultural, I mean, preferences too. I'm pro natalism, yeah. you know, all that too. Um, yeah, absolutely. But even pronatalism, I think, can be expressed in terms of like a long term market, like or, or at least the, or the health of the economy. Right. Um, but the um, I hear you express some sympathy for transhumanism uh, or sort of, you know, really like making technology the uh, sort of spiritual, uh, you know, North Star. At the same time, technology can also be used for, you know, sort of anti-market, you know, a great, greater centralization or, you know, makes, uh, you know, people always used to say that communism wasn't. Uh, technologically possible, but with AI, it, it, it might be, uh, you know, sort of central planning uh, fallacy, of, of course. But uh, do you worry about that? Is that uh, sort of transhumanism being used for, for you know, anti-market uh, ends? It depends on the context. In China, I mean, they seem to have done a really good job of using technology to oppress their population. I mean, they, you know, facial recognition, like, uh, so like, take just one issue, right? Facial recognition technology. In China, it's used to oppress people. Um, in the U S we go way too far and we have, we're ridiculous. Like I've written about like medical privacy rules and how, how they hinder, uh, medical research and just bringing the cost down in medicine. So we're so far like in our context in, in the context of this, this country, Western civilization in general, we are too much on the side of sort of stagnation and let it not letting the technology uh, run free. It's theoretically possible that the American government could use facial recognition technology to lock up dissidents. Some very paranoid right wing people believe that that's um, a risk, you know, like a serious risk to worry about. I think it's a theoretical risk, but I don't think like our institutions would stand for that or we're anywhere close to that. Um, so it really does depend on on the context. I think the Chinese are sort of a very unique situation where you have like a non-representative government and a society that's good at tech and has a lot of state capacity, but doesn't have like a lot of concerns for individual liberty. And with that combination, yeah, it could be a problem. Yeah. The, um, it's interesting. Going back to sort of the, the biotech, you sort of, you, you've been talking about non-surrogacy, reproductive technology, et cetera. What's interesting is in the last few years, there seems to be sort of this rise of reactionary feminism, sort of the Louise Perry's, the, the Mary Harrington's, sort of this whole cadre of, of people who started to gain uh, sort of, you know, some, some, uh, some adherence um, when they talk about sort of, uh, you know, what the sexual revolution has done for, for, you know, women not being as happy, perhaps, or not being able to find, find, find uh, sort of husbands or what has done for fertility, or um, just some negative effects of sort of, you know, second wave feminism, but it feels like your sort of um, stance is contra what they want too. It almost seems like reactionary, reactionary fe feminism or, or is that, how would you contextualize it? Yeah. I mean, those aren't my political allies. I mean, this is sort of why I have a problem with, you know, you sometimes see right wingers and they're just, uh, I'll give you an example. So Yarvin, uh, by the way, I'll plug my debate, uh, February yeah. 9th. Um, I don't know when's this going to come out, but there might not be tickets come out this, uh, before then. So people should, should go to it. I'm, I'm going to check it out. So yeah. Yeah. Well, so anyways, I bring it up because Yarvin was, um, he had this article about Rufo. Um, did you read that article? Um, I did at the time, but I'm, I can't remember. He was okay. basically saying his efforts are futile or. Well, something like that, but it's funny. He's like, Rufo likes Thomas Paine and the American Revolution. It's like, that's stupid. I'm Yarvin. I don't like any of that stuff. But like, if Rufo wants to win, he should do XYZ. And my commentary was like, why Rufo, you just said Rufo is like, 
doesn't have the same ideas as you or like he's not on your side. So like, why are you giving him a political advice? Like you're his consultant or something, right? It just, there's this sort of, you know, tendency to collapse everything in the right and left, right and left. And I, you know, I'm not one of those people who says no labels, you know, they're never useful. Uh, but I think there's just, there is a tendency to just sort of, like a lot of sort of right wing discourses about like how friendly you should be to the left and how much you should use power. And I, you know, I say for what, like, there's some things that I want the right wing to do and I want some things that I don't want them to do. Um, and so the, um, yeah, Mary Harrington and Louise Perry. Yeah. Like, yeah, like, so people like Louise Perry, I mean, I, I don't dislike Louise Perry personally, nothing personally about them. I mean, but they're not, they, they don't agree with me on anything. And it's sort of weird. I mean, it's sort of weird. I see Mary Harrington on like Fox News and stuff. And, you know, it's like, I think it's like she was against sometimes like if you just agree with right-wing people on a few of these hot button issues, they'll, they'll accept you as one of theirs. Cause, cause Mary Harrington is anti-trans. Um, you know, she'll go on right. She'll be on right-wing media. I think she's something of a socialist. I don't know if she still, actually is, but I, I know she's like, she doesn't like markets and these other things. And then like, uh, you know, you see the same thing sort of with Glenn, Glenn Greenwald because they'll support the conservative narrative um, about Trump and these other things. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's out there. I'm going to write something more about general like I think that a lot of these social conservatives, they're they are trying to play five D chess with society. Um, a lot of them, they will say we can't do X. You know, they're they're either they're making a slippery slope argument, or they're doing some version of like we're creating a culture that's going to do these other things that are not directly related to the issue at hand, right? And I don't think there's like much evidence for like what they argue. So like for example, like. The euthanasia issue. Some of them, I I argued with this about this with Bruce Ross Duthat on a uh, on Twitter. A lot of them say you're going to create a slippery slope. You know they're going to start murdering everybody. Well, okay. There's countries in Europe which have had legalized euthanasia for decades, and countries where it's completely illegal. And like they're the ones who have had euthanasia, like the Netherlands, they're not you know slaughtering people in large numbers. You tell me where they're less moral than Spain or Italy, which doesn't have euthanasia, right? So this stuff should be. Um, you know, the, like, or they'll say like, okay, you know, like pornography, you know, you got to ban that stuff like that because it's going to create, you know, you're going to create a uh, socially conservative sort of natalist culture. And it's like, you look at South Korea, right? They ban pornography. Um, they have the lowest, you know, fertility rate in the world. There's just no evidence for like these connections that they sort of make between their preferences and these like broader goods that they talk about. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's, it's sort of like, you know, they're playing 4D chess and they're not really like establishing like what they're, what they tend to argue for. Yeah. W w um, I think where, where you do uh, align with um, sort of the Louis Perez of the world is I guess you care about the birth rate. I don't, I don't know if that's, I guess enough uh, overlap, but I guess, how do you see just the context of where feminism is going? Someone like rad femme Hitler, where, uh, if that's your name, <laughs> our page, where, where does she uh, like fit in or where do you see feminism going? Uh, I, you know, I had her on my podcast. I, I, I like her personally. I don't know if that she's representative of, you know, much. I, I think that, you know, if at, at this point, although I, you know, there are sort of these little circles that, you know, there's always these things sort of bubbling beneath the surface. Um, it, yeah, it, it's, it's far from having a real world influence, but some kind of like attitudinal, like you men leave me, leave us alone with our, you know, bodies and like to be otherwise be right wing in a lot of ways and sort of disgusted with the, you know, left wing culture. I think that's, you know, that, is something that would be interesting and worth supporting. Um, you know, at this point, I, I think it's, we're far, far from that. You see a right wing woman who's got any kind of, um, institutional support or is making it on TV or like, you know, has like op eds or is getting, you know, a lot of attention. It's, you know, it's generally they're either conventionally conservative or actually somebody like, uh, Harris or, or, or Harrington or, or Perry, you know, very focused on sort of these, you know, anti reproductive, uh, freedoms or these sort of religious agenda. Yeah. You, you, you relatedly you linked to uh, a piece in Aporia the other week about how um, in the baby boom in the in the thirties or forties that was really led by a marriage boom which was uh, you know which and what led to that was sort of a rise in uh, in male status and we even talked about that on the last episode of if you just gave you know, almost like a UBI for men those aren't your words yeah. but those are mine but like uh, if you suddenly increase male male status relative to um, relative to women. Um, you might have more more kids, <laughs> uh, or, or, uh, and so obviously that idea is an anathema to many people. Um, but it does feel like even Richard Reeves' book, who's a respectable academic, sort of talking about how men are men are struggling relative to relative to women. 
Um, do you see a, a DEI for men or UBI for men at any time in our future? Or do you think men are just going to continue to be lower status um, the women on the kind of the media. <laughs> well, I mean, there is, a, you know, there is, there is a libertarian answer to this, which is that a lot of these fields, the most, you know, fields that tend to be have a lot of women are government, uh, healthcare, education, a lot of government supported fields, you know, something like welding or like whatever these things, oil industry, these things that like, and, you know, it's weird because, you know, uh, um, status is determined by sort of money and education are like the two big things in our society. And women are very good at school. Women are very good at just sitting there turning their paper in on time with good penmanship and getting along with the teacher and women are i don't know 55 60 percent whatever of college graduates now so it's like that's part of the status game that helps them if you sent 18 year olds out into the world you sent men and women men would make a you know as with a, 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 barring only fans on like prostitution <laughs> right not insulting women i'm just saying like men have more marketable skills at 18 years old they're going to fund more businesses they're going to do like the hard stuff that go work on the oil rig the stuff that pays like tons of money but is very very unpleasant like men will go and do, and do that stuff. Um, so like, yeah, I mean, of all the good reasons to sort of defund education, I mean, that's another one, just maybe it's we're wasting young people's lives anyway. Um, and so a lot of the stuff doesn't have to be sort of artificial raising men's status. So through yeah. UBI or whatever, you know, but I'm not even sure. Like I find the birth rate issue very, uh, it's very, it's sort of mysterious because that's like, you know, it's a theory in that thing, but then I, in that article, but then I think if you, you know, you would predict that like, if you saw a big, gender gap in earnings in different countries, like those countries would have higher birth rates, right? They're, you know, and I don't know if we see that. Um, I, you know, I think, I think I've seen data actually going back to Korea is such a weird country in so many ways, but like they, they have, I think one of the biggest gaps in, uh, gender gaps in, um, uh, I cannot, and uh, earnings. I'm not sure if that's right. I, it might, I might have been Japan or something like that. But anyways, I looked into it a little bit, and there didn't seem to be any correlation. There didn't seem to be like where men earn a lot more money. And actually, the, these some of these socially traditional societies, they more traditional societies like Southern Europe and like uh, East Asia, um, they, uh, you know, they, they, um, they. I think they people would say they they have higher male status relative yeah. to female. I mean, well, maybe not. I mean, maybe it's all one global culture and maybe that's not a good test. I'm not sure. You know, I'm not exactly yeah. sure how exactly to think about this. You, um, in a recent post, you meant you talked about how, um, you know, we like to think that, um, men and women are, are equal in terms of IQ with some, you know, men of high, higher variants, but actually maybe men are, you know, a couple points higher or, or, or something to that effect. Um, but if women are naturally better at school, I, I, how important is IQ? Is it just that school is not a, like being better at school doesn't really matter or, or doesn't equate with the market or how do we make sense? Yeah, of, I, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, a cor I mean, it's a correlation. I mean, it, it, there's a correlation between school and um, IQ, you know, but I, school is, you know, effort and, and like really just conscientiousness showing up on time, um, doing all that other stuff. The market, I mean, you know, the market, re the market re rewards intelligence, but also, you know, to a large extent, again, going back to doing unpleasant work, like a lot of the things that pay good, like writing doesn't pay good money relative to like what a person is smart enough to be a good writer uh, could be doing uh, elsewhere. Um, because writing is a relatively pleasant, you know, activity rather than being a, a lawyer at a corporate firm or something, right? It's just, or an accountant or, or, uh, you know, some kind of bureaucrat or something. And so, you know, men have more sort of, well, I mean, I think that this makes perfect evolutionary sense because men um, want more, want money more than women, want their own money more than women, right? In order to be attract, to attract mates. Um, and so like, yeah, I mean, it's the, you know, the market is not a pure IQ test. It's who's willing to provide the goods and services, which IQ can help with um, that people want to buy. Um, and yeah, men tend to do better. I mean, I think that a lot of sort of the gender, the uh, gender equality, a lot of it of the, um, uh, the, the equality to the extent we see it, a lot of it's artificial. It's because of, you know, things like educational credentialism, th you know, society artificially propping up things women are good at. So you, you say no, uh, no affirmative action or DEI in, in, uh, in education uh, to, get, to get it to 50-50 and more just stop, uh, you know, artificially inflating um, sort of, you know, credentials. I mean, I, I, you know, it's sort of, I feel like about the way the DEI arguments, it's like, I, I just think there should be less school. I think that's the big one. It's not about whether, you know, Asians are 25 or 20% of Harvard or men are 55 or six. It's like school is a, is robbing young people of the best years of their life and costing a lot of money for no appreciable gain. And people should focus on that. I mean, the other stuff is sort of secondary. 
And, and so you'll and you'll get the knockoff, like I said, you'll get the knockoff positive effects on gender relations potentially. And so instead of school, what should people be doing? Just going straight to the workforce or uh, other types of experiences? Yeah, I mean, like, well, there's a, you know, there's a, um, a collective action problem. And like, it doesn't, I'm not necessarily saying any one person should not go to school. Um, if you're like, you know, somebody like me, where I don't know, you know, I didn't know anybody growing up. And, you know, I it was nice to go to sort of elite schools and just meet some people and, and other things like that. Um, that could be beneficial. And, you know, the credential does matter. So I'm not, I'm, for the individual level, um, I'm not necessarily giving advice, but we as a society should be uh, discouraging people from going to school. We should be funding it less. We should be, you know, whatever, culturally encouraging, um, yeah. pe you know, making people aware of opportunities that are out there. Uh, you know, what would you do, you know, between 18? I don't know. What, what do you do when you're out of school? The same thing, right? You do it inst instead of 22 or 23, you do it at 18. What can you yeah. do at 23? You can't do it at 18. You know, there's, the, the world is out there for you yeah, yeah. but uh but at 23 you've you've got a major in sociology so you can do a lot yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> um or gender studies or something so um going back to this concept of um uh, of sort of how true society can be you know there's been the broader conversation about sort of the race realism um versus sort of you know colorblind ism um and or the colorblind approach and sort of, you know, Amy Wax on your podcast, you guys had a debate about it, it was great. She talks, she says it takes a theory to beat a theory. And unless you can have a plausible explanation for why there are group differences, um, then people are gonna just call prejudice. And of course, Thomas Hull, you know, says it's, it's culture or something. And and Nathan went on your podcast and uh, Nick Kaufness and didn't think that that was a, a good approach. Where, where do you net out on whether whether it's race realism or, or, or you know, versus colorblindism or just this broader concept of, you know, how, when can you say truths that people don't want to hear versus when should you uh, emphasize other things? Yeah. I mean, I have become very, um, I, I, this is another thing, you know, you're asking good questions because this is another thing I, I mean to write on. Um, the, um, I, I'm coming more to the position that I took with Amy, which I was uh, sort of, uh, sort of, uh, uh, ambivalent on, but I've become more to like believe in it more as, as time has gone on. And I think the reason for this is the people who uh, talk a lot about race realism and talk about, uh, differences between groups. They tend to have a predictable set of politics. And a lot of people actually, like, they think they're the only ones who, like, know this data or seen the research, and they're not. It's just the people who have a very specific sort of niche sort of political program um, are the ones who are, uh, uh, who are like obsessed with talking about this. So these people tend to be very anti-immigration. Uh, they tend to, you know, uh, prioritize wokeness, all this other stuff. Um, they tend to be more nationalistic, which like I pointed out to Kaufman, like there's no, there's no like necessary connection between believing in group differences and being a nationalist, right? Um, and then the, a lot of people like believe in group differences, but they're either liberals or libertarians and they don't find the need to talk about it. And it's a consistent pattern. And why is, why is that? Because I think it's like, they're, you know, I think that they're, they're like, you know, no science, you know, I'm sounding like a leftist, but like no, no science is neutral, right? Whatever you're talking about, it's at the opportunity cost of talking about something else, right? And so I think it's very, very wrapped up in a very, very specific agenda. Um, and, you know, whether you want to talk about it or not is like how interested you are in that agenda. And so I'm not that interested in that agenda at this point. So I, you know, would rather probably not talk about these things. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. And I um, let's let's transition to to or segue to Curtis a little bit because I um, we had him on, on on a podcast recently and I asked him you know what are you uh, hoping to di discuss with Richard and one thing he said was that he was plugging the debate as well and one thing he said is that he doesn't know how to square how Richard you know believes group differences and yet is also sort of as pro immigration as as he is um, and you know there's the clear economic uh, uh effect um or you know reason to have i guess how do you sort of think about on the immigration side when is like what is sort of the cutoff between what when someone or a type of person is net positive versus, versus net negative or yeah, uh, yeah what is what you think about it? the uh so yeah that's funny that yarvin would say that because it's a very conventional critique i would have thought some kind of higher you know sort of higher uh uh level big brain how do you you know what did you read this you know book from 1655 and you know doesn't it disprove everything you believe or something like that but it's a very sort of common critique i you know i think with immigration i i think there's a presumption against 
and this is like getting a group difference, like allows people to believe it. And to me, there's a presumpti- presumption against discriminating against people based on their uh, where they were born. There's just a presumption against that. Um, and, and Curtis would probably say not, and a lot of these other people would say would say the opposite. But you know, I believe that. I don't think you know they compare nationalism to family. It's not the same because you know we. You know, it's, I mean, it's obviously not the same because people always care about their family. There's an evolutionary explanation for it. Um, there's a genetic explanation. Some people try to play these games with, you know, the evolutionary psych, evolutionary psychology. I don't, I don't think they're very successful. Um, the and and so there's we start with that presumption, and then you, you know, if you, you know, my grades like you say, well, you know, what should Israel and people say? Oh, you're hawkish on Israel. Should you? Uh, for open borders with the Palestinians. I'm like, no, because that will destroy Israel. So it, it is, you know, that's a, it's a presumption. And then with that presumption, it responds to real world uh, events and, you know, facts on the ground. Um, in the American context, you're getting a lot of migrants who are not that bad. I'm sorry, they 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 have so many videos of these uh, these uh, uh, young Hispanics coming to the country. All the videos are of them just walking into the country. You would think they would have videos of them rioting or do. They have a lot of videos of American inner city, like a lot of crime out there, um, but they don't have videos of these migrants it's just like they're taking up space or they're just like walking or they're just coming into the country um you know there they you know there is you know hispanic americans um you know have the second generation at least do have a higher crime rate it's not at the level where it's like you know civilization destroying or anything like that i mean it is you know a concern i want to you know but you know i I want tougher tougher on crime policies sure um and the europe you know in the european context is sort of in between uh, Israel and the U.S., where if the U.S. should be, you should be open to immigration, and Israel, you should definitely not be open to immigration from your neighbors. Europe is somewhere in between because a lot of these populations are distinct. They do cause a lot of problems. And in that context, I'm not, you know, so like gung-ho, absolutist open borders. So, you know, this is to me is a, you know, it depends on, it depends on the evidence. It's not an absolute either. And, and these people, these HBD race realist types, you never find that art. You never find, okay, it's not that bad in America. It's okay in Japan or it's not okay in Europe. No, they all just want to close immigration. So that shows, I think, that like this, this idea about, you know, just going to the science is really about sort of bringing forward a political agenda. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And the, um, but on the illegals, uh, someone had this time recently, like 12 million illegals over, over a certain, you know, a short period of time. Like at, at what point do you think it's, it becomes, starts to become a, uh, an issue, or, pro- or what is the right way to think about the right uh, amount of immigration? I don't know. I mean, it's 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 numbers. I mean, it, it's numbers times, you know, it's numbers and diversity. Like if they're all from one place, you know, it's cultural cohesion. If they're gonna, you know, it's something like Islam, a very distinct religion. They, you know, they marry within each other. They have these cultural practices that set them apart from the rest of society. I mean, you're creating a different kind of society when you bring in, you know, a large Muslim population. You're not really when you're bringing in a, a Hispanic population to something like the United States. And then like we have a lot of, you know, Asian immigration too. And so there's like all these groups that are, uh... so the numbers, I'm not, I'm not concerned about numbers. I mean, if it was a billion or something, you know, yeah, but I, I don't see evidence that like we're falling. And like, you know, the things people talk about, like, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of the things that people talk about are things I see as sort of having low hanging fruit solutions, like the cost of housing um, or like, um, you know, uh, like, the, you know, the crime. I, I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit in crime. We talked about like facial recognition technology, which you basically can't use, which could actually, you know, there, D- Jennifer Doliak had a good paper on DNA surveillance and like how just like taking the DNA of criminals and like doing database checks and like just, you know, getting them scared to get arrested again, like how big of a like effect that has on recidivism rates. So I think there's just like the, the things that people complain about at this point in time. I mean, they're just, they're stuff that is, are solvable with relatively easy solutions. And I think people should focus on those. Makes sense. I, I want to segue, you know, gearing towards closing here, going back to your debate with Curtis in a, in a couple weeks. Um, where, what are you hoping to get out of the debate or where, where are you uh, wanting it to go? What are you wanting to discuss? Yeah, I, I don't want to give, I sort of don't want to give away too much because I think that's sort of like, if he just tells you his argument and I tell you my argument, like we've, we've had, we've sort of had the debate already. Um, and so it's going to be fun. Yeah. I just, people should just show up and. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe you know, another way. Another way of asking maybe is like, what do you think is Curtis's uh, contribution? Um, or yeah, where do you put Curtis as a, as a, like, what has he contributed to the discourse to the extent that we, we it's, it's influential? Yeah. I mean, I think some of the, I think some of the stuff on, 
you know, like, uh, you know, sort of, you know, how executives function, how governments function. I think some of that stuff is valuable. I mean, I think that the um, sort of the, uh, uh, you know, just like to the extent that he brings actually group population differences, you know, a lot of people talk about that now, but he was, you know, pretty early uh, talking about that stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, Curtis, Curtis has made some contributions. I think that like, I think I was probably closer to him and a lot of his fans five to 10 years ago. Um, and I'm not there anymore. And which uh, that's, that's what I think actually just sort of makes the debate so interesting. So yeah, that's, that's yeah, why I'm looking yeah. forward to it. Totally. And, and maybe we'll segue another, uh, or, or close with another topic that you've written about a few times, which is the, the effective altruism movement. You had a, you had a great post about uh, why EA will be woke or die that I often recommend because it's part of it's about EA, but part of it's just about what happens to groups as they grow and as certain voices uh, come in um, and, and certainly groups that are predicated upon truth and, 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 and rationality, um, but end up being sort of, um, you know, warped. And then they have this tough decision to make, which is do they make some people really upset <laughs> or, um, or do, and, or do they stick to their, to their value uh, or, or do they sort of concede their values? And it's interesting because effective altruism, you know, has had two major blows in the last uh, year and a half. One was the uh, SBF, um, you know, being seen as the poster child for everything that's wrong with uh, with the egg sort of utils maximizing, uh, you know, and even willing to commit crimes to do that. Um, and then the second one was open AI, where there was sort of rumored, uh, you know, sort of the perception is that there was a, a, a somewhat of a coup on somewhat on EA grounds. And the justification was that AI was a risk to, you know, humanity or AGI was risk to humanity and thus firing Sam Altman, um, you know, was utility maximizing. Um, and so, yeah, I'm curious for any commentary on, uh, on, uh, on effective watch. You're, you're sympathetic to a lot of it because it's, it's great thinking. It's inspired, inspired uh, mm -hmm. a lot of other great um, thinking as well. What's your take here? Yeah, I mean, a lot of EAs they focus, they they center around the uh, uh, AI issue, and I'm just I'm I feel so divided about this. I do think that if like the world doesn't end in like five years, a a EA and uh, is going to have sort of back on its face because they you know these people are just worried, and you know you can't sort of keep that up forever. Uh, they can't just keep delaying the apocalypse. Um, Religions do that, but I, you know, I don't think for EAs, I think that you know people will start questioning, um, as as is inherent in its nature, um, and so yeah, we, we've, we're going to have to see sort of how this AI thing shakes out. I mean, they're going to look very prescient if, if if there is some kind of major thing between now and you know the end of the world. Um, if there's some moment where we realize that oh things are going haywire and something very strange uh, is happening, um, I think Tyler said that uh, EA had peaked. Um, I think that EA is sort of destiny it's not a you know it's not like a you shouldn't think about it like a political movement the way you think about sort of libertarians or something like that or like a conservative movement or something because it's i think it real i think that like if you're going to focus on effectiveness you're going to avoid controversy like a libertarian or you know a wokes or whatever they're going to go and they're going to fight for the thing they want because they think they want many people opposed strongly like a lot of the ea stuff i think like where the leverage is to make the world a better place is often where people aren't thinking about the issue much it's like oh like do charity this way instead of that way or like change this little regulation that's gonna you know harm you know that's been harming technological development um and so scott alexander uh, had I think he he linked to some website that listed some ac recent accomplishments of EA and they were you know they were impressive and I hadn't heard about any of them uh, until then and maybe that's you know if EA wants to do good it can sort of do good in the shadows I think it's it's probably not going to be a uh, sort of a trendy and, and you know there's cost to that because if you're just sort of doing things sort of behind the scenes um, you know you're not really building and becoming a giant movement or whatever. Um, but I think that's sort of the limit. That's the, that's the sort of inherent limitation of just focusing on, you know, just completely being utilitarian and focusing what's, uh, what's effective. You're not going to inspire people, but that's okay. You could do some good things in the meantime. Yeah. That's a good place to wrap, wrap that issue. Um, we're, we're at time now. So, uh, um, since it's closing, the, the debate is February 9th with Curtis Yarvin. People should mm -hmm. check it out. Yeah, we'll and Anna that. Hashania, or whatever, however you oh, yeah. pronounce her name, the Red Scare Girl Red is going to be Anna. the uh, yes. uh, moderator. Yes, uh, the book is Origins of Woke. Is there anything uh, top of mind related to our, our conversations that we you didn't get to that you wanted to make make sure to get to? 
Uh, no, you you did a pretty thorough job of covering sort of what's up, what's on my mind right now. So yeah, good job with that, Eric. Just yeah, people should subscribe to the Substack and, yes. and follow on Twitter, and all the essays that I've been foreshadowing will be coming in hopefully the next weeks and months. Yes, I'm a paid uh, subscriber, and I recommend uh, listeners uh, subscribe as well. Um, Richard, always uh, always a pleasure. And until next time, appreciate it. Thanks, Eric. Upstream with Eric Tornberg is a show from Turpentine, the podcast network behind Moment of Zen and Cognitive Revolution. If you like the episode, please leave a review in the Apple Store. Turpentine is a network of podcasts, newsletters, and more covering tech, business, and culture, all from the perspective of industry insiders and experts. We're the network behind the show you're listening to right now. At Turpentine, we're building the first media outlet for tech people by tech people. We have a slate of hit shows across a range of topics and industries, from AI with Cognitive Revolution to Econ 102 with Noah Smith. Our other shows drive the conversation in tech with the most interesting thinkers, founders, and investors, like Moment of Zen and my show Upstream. We're looking for industry-leading hosts and shows along with sponsors. If you think that might be you or your company, email me at eric at turpentine.co. That's E-R-I-K at turpentine.co.